All right, welcome everyone to the HVAC 2.0 show. So tonight we are going to finish, which I'm uh, actually in, in some part happy for, because it's a lot of work preparing all this stuff, uh, the, the fresh air ventilation series. Um, and tonight we are talking about what I view as real magic, because it's super useful for the residential scale, which is reheat dehumidification. And so we're going to talk about what it is, pros, cons, um, and do some myth busting while we're at it too. So through all of this, um, keep in mind that this is good judgment, but the good judgment comes from experience and the experience comes from bad judgment. So all of this stuff is learned. So you can either take our word for it and learn the easy way, or you can go out there and try it yourself and screw it up yourself. And then you can report back and then it'll, the lesson will stick that way. I can guarantee you that a lot of these lessons are sticky because um, it was uh, painful and difficult to, to learn and fix. So here's order of operations for tonight. So we are going to review the last couple of weeks very briefly, and then we're going to tie all this together. So tonight, the goal is we're, we're going to take a whole bunch of concepts and we're going to tie them together into one. Um, uh, because the, the, the best system that we have figured out to do something that works really well, but is not crazy difficult to install, not crazy difficult to sell, um, it's something that tackles all of the six functions of HVAC. So we're gonna look at that. Next up, we will be looking at what is reheat and the different options for it. Third, we're going to deal with the myth of, but it's really expensive, right? Well, we'll find out. And then we're gonna tie it all back together into what we call badass HVAC. Um, and it's also known as nearly perfect HVAC. So with that, let's get started. So let's back up. First week, we talked about the ventilation. It's gone from suck to blow. Um, so I'd always look for a way to use this space ball scene, and here we were. And basically, we it, it made the case that every house needs fresh air, and it's mainly because of shoulder seasons. And then also that fresh air is both filtered and dry because the vast majority of Americans, everyone here actually tonight, lives in a dry, or sorry, in a humid climate. So we need dehumidification. And I'm still on the tail end of that cold, unfortunately, uh, but feeling a hell of a lot better than last week. And what we ended up doing with this first week was of the three strategies, sucking, blowing, and sucking and blowing at the same time, we took sucking off the table because sucking sucks. You end up pulling from places that you don't want to breathe. The next week we dealt with ERVs and HRVs. Um, and I, I lo love this meme, Tanner. Thank you. I asked Tanner for a meme and uh, like we, it's, we need something with Samuel L. Jackson. So here it is. So if you don't need Samuel L. Jackson to describe how cold your winters are, you don't need an ERV or an HRV. And we actually ran the numbers and I don't know that you need one anywhere. I don't know that they justify anymore. So we talked about how they are old thinking and they rob budget that is better spent elsewhere. So an ERV or an HRV is like five to 10 grand installed, might be as much as 15 with the duct system. There are way better ways to spend that money on most projects. And then also they do not dehumidify. So they end up adding moisture, not subtracting. And if you're trying to get filtered dry outdoor air, this is not helping. So we took sucking and blowing or balanced ventilation off the table as a main option. Uh, the week after that, well, because now we're stuck on, on blowing here, we've got just a couple of different options for that. And one of them is a ventilating dehumidifier. And so we are generally big fans of these, but they have pluses and minuses. So here's the hypothesis. It's a good fix if you are replacing equipment or if you're not replacing equipment rather. So something that's new that has dehumidification problems, or if you're running a hybrid. Um, we're going to talk more about that later. If you are replacing a system, consider systems that have reheat dehumidification, which we're going to be talking about. And then we also think when whatever you are selling, if you're selling basic stuff, um, always offer them if you're in a green grass climate. It should be the bottom line of every single bid. Um, because that way, if you offer good dehumidification and people don't take you up on it and they have dehumidification problems, you can point it back at them. So that's responsibly avoiding responsibility. 
Ken, love your shirt tonight, by the way. I is greater than you. Um, Ken has a bunch of good t-shirts. So just keep an eye on that. Um, for, uh, I, I don't know you, you're like 70, but you still act like a teenager in a bunch of your ways. It's hilarious. So, um, boomers, man, you guys are awesome. All right. The next week we dealt with blowing is best. So uh, if we have taken sucking and sucking and blowing off the table, we need to look more closely at blowing, which is what we did. And fundamentally, people think that we are suggesting that we're going to nuke the house and blow it up and cause all kinds of issues. And we talked about how reality is much closer to a mouse fart than it is an atomic bomb. Um, if you want to go see more about this, go on back. But what I totally ignored last week in the discussion of doing the blowing uh, uh, strategy where you're just running a duct from outdoors in, um, I, I ignored dehumidification. And the reason for that is what we're talking about this week, reheat dehumidification. And all of this to tie it back together, I've, I've used the slide a couple of times, but what is the best mid-price system? So say we've got 20 grand. So 20 grand is a, a, a reasonably expensive system, but not crazy. I hear lots of $20,000 notes, uh, uh, $20,000 prices now, you know, a basic system is maybe 10 or 12. You get into a, a really complicated, expensive, you might, a uh, complicated and expensive install might be 30, something like that. But what can we do in the middle that is uh, a very good system, provides good comfort, good indoor air quality, and a good chunk of people will actually say yes and buy it. Ted, you want to add Abby there? Now, what we want to be able to do with any system, so this is, again, we are taking a step back from just ventilation and we're looking at what a complete HVAC system should be able to do. It should be able to do six things, six functions. So the first and the most important for delivering comfort is load matching. You want it to be variable speed, variable output, so that it can put out is exactly as much heating or cooling as the house needs at that moment. And if you run the numbers, you'll see that even with right size variable speed equipment, it's very difficult to do that for more than about 50% of the year, like surprisingly hard. Um, and most systems are wrong, you know, 80, 90, or hundred percent of the year. Second thing you want to deal with is filtration to keep the garbage out, reduces dusting, um, uh, makes it knocks out a bunch of bacteria and viruses. There's all kinds of stuff that comes out there. Good dehumidification, uh, which we talked about with the ventilating dehues. You want to bring in outdoor air, fresh air, right place at the right time, which I now call mixing. This is like uh, stirring the house like a vinaigrette. So if you have rooms that are a little warmer, a little bit cooler, if you run the air handler, they're always um, getting blunted a little bit because you're moving the air around. And then the last one, depending on your climate, is humidification. And not everyone needs that. So we have been focusing on filtration, dehumidification, and fresh air. That's what we've been looking at because that's all, that's what you have to deal with with outdoor air. Now, uh, if you've heard me talk about this, you know that in the six functions, all cars can do five. So you've got load matching and you can set how hot or cold you want it. You've got also fan speed. Filtration, you've got the cabin air filter coming in. Dehumidification looks like the air conditioner button. Fresh air, you've got the buttons for bringing it in or not. And mixing, you can aim the air wherever you want it. So cars are really, really good at this. Houses, on the other hand, oftentimes can't do any of these well at all, um, if at all. And so if we know all of this, but we don't at least offer it to clients, we are falling prey to this knowledge unapplied is useless. So if we aren't letting people know and we're never installing something, we might as well not know that we're just continuing worst practices. So the easiest way that we have found to deliver all of this with one system, that's not too crazy. We call badass HVACs, which stands for big air drop air source system. And uh, we also call it from a consumer perspective, nearly perfect HVAC. It's not perfect. Um, there is really hardly any perfect HVAC or a perfect HVAC would probably involve other devices on top of this. But here's what they do. So load matching, you have a right-sized 
variable speed, communicating heat pump. I, I don't know that this can be done without communication. You need to be able to change the, the coil, the temperature at will, and you really need communication to do that. Um, and it's always a heat pump because their outputs are lower than furnaces. So like a, a three ton heat pump that dials down to 25% goes to 9,000 BTUs where a 60 K mod furnace is only going to dial to maybe 20,000. Some of them are 25 or 30. So uh, you can get much lower and cover a much larger percentage of the year with that. Next up is filtration. You put a big media filter in. We like doing these horizontally. This is thinking of a basement install. If you're an attic, um, obviously just flatten this whole thing out. And the filter is one of the nice pieces of dealing with a big assumption, which is what maintenance can you assume that homeowners will do? Zero. That's the only safe assumption. So at least if you are running a, um, oh, what is it doing? Uh, I clicked the wrong button on here. Um, if you're running one filter and it's a large media filter, it will probably survive a year without being changed. I'm not saying it's ideal, but you probably won't hit two inches of static and, and eat the ECM as long as um, you, you right sized it and you put a good size filter in. So that's one way to avoid failures. Next up is dehumidification. This is a hybrid here. This is a furnace with uh, a heat pump. You don't have 24 seven capability. It's not possible. You can't put heat into the coil. The heat has to come after the coil, which we're going to get to. So this actually isn't badass. Then fourth, you get a fresh air duct. Fifth, the large ductwork um, makes it so that it uses almost no power. If you remember back in the ERV week, we showed that air handlers use 15 to 40 watts to move three or 400 CFM. So almost no power to run all the time. And then humidification, we talked about this last week, water saver humidifiers are one of the safer bets because they, they can't put too much moisture into the house and rot them out. And you show this to clients through this. Um, I mean, this is the equipment and install options. We'll be coming back to it. But here's your smiley faces. You show a basic system as a one inch filter, no outdoor duct, single stage. Um, this sucks. So you can show this and then be like, so my competitors that have a cheap price, this is what they're offering. I will sell you this if you want, and our prices will be comparable, but is this really what you want? And then if you walk them through the rest of it with a little bit of education, which we have all built for you, um, it, you'll probably be surprised how often people will take the better and the best options. So that's what we see. And so the best option here, or even the better, like this is like a five stage unit and this is fully variable. I'm thinking about the carrier or Bryant lines and, you know, pick your manufacturer. It'll, it'll be that. But again, all this comes back to what is the best mid price system that we can install for a client that delivers just excellent results. Cause if we deliver fabulous results, do we get referrals? Hell yes, we do. And what is the cheapest form of marketing and the highest closing ratios that we deal with? Referrals. So that's what we want. Um, so a lot of this comes down to, you think about, if you remember in the, the ERV one, where we had that one that was uh, wired into the light in the attic. So it had never run because unless the attic light was on, the ERV wasn't on. Um, if we had an extra five or 10 grand over basic equipment, what could we do? Because, you know, your basic system's 10 grand ballpark. Um, so what could we do at 15 or 20? And that's where these sorts of things come in. So back to the elephant in the room. To actually deal with dehumidification, we can do this with one system without a separate dehumidifier, or at least a $250 one, not a, a, a whole house dehu. We can add that with reheat dehumidification where you actually add heat back to uh, the cold, dry air after it comes out of the coil. So we'll get to more of that in a bit. And here's a, an important point. This is our house in Ohio. I could pick anything that I want. Doesn't really matter. I picked a five-stage carrier, a VNA-8. This is the best mid-price six-function solution. Here's the kicker, though. 
yay government, it doesn't qualify for the federal IRA tax credit in northern states. So Tanner, you still can use this, but I can't. Half of our electrifications were done with this unit. So that kind of sucks. Um, took a really key tool off the table for us. And who knows, maybe Carrier will retest and they'll, they'll manage to get it to sneak through. But uh, it, it was off by a little ways in a couple of performance numbers. But any anything that I can do, and that's what I picked. All right, so that's our review and then the six functions. What is reheat? So before we dive into what, we need to start with why. The why is shoulder seasons. So this is a client uh, back in 2019 in September. And you can see what his relative humidities were. So he was running above 60% for most of the month. Now, he's a windows open kind of guy. And, you know, that's fine. And actually, you're generally safe to run a house that way if you have a, a DHU in the basement. But if you have the air conditioner on and you get into these ranges, bad stuff is most likely happening. And here's another way to look at it. Uh, this was uh, Fubot. And it, it kills me like two months after this, they, they pulled it from the market. And I was like, oh, they finally got dew point. This is the first time that I've had dew point to actually look at because um, relative humidity isn't particularly useful. You need to know what the temperature is. Dew point is super useful to be able to compare. So 55 degrees is the sweet spot that you want to be at. What percentage of the month is below 55? It's basically one day. So it's a couple percent. So this house was in a danger zone of mold and chemicals and all kinds of bad things happen all of September. This is shoulder season when it's neither super hot or super cold. So we looked last week at dew point calculator. So let's put some stuff in here. So this is upstairs. So this is above ground, windows open, 75 degrees out, 70 degree dew point. Most of us on the eastern part of the country see about two months a year, maybe more, of these kind of conditions. So Tanner, you might see more in Alabama. Um, and so the problem is 75, there's not much cooling load, but we have really damp air. And if you look over here at days, the mold, it's eight days in these conditions and you're going to have mold growing. It's 83% relative. So this is dangerous. And this is why like you're okay until you start cooling. And as soon as you start cooling and dropping temperatures, things get bad. Now that same condition, let's take it down to the basement where we're below ground and we have a basement wall that's 68 degrees. What happens? Now we're talking 100% relative, which means we have condensation. Condensation goes onto a wall. The wall has dirt on it. They always have dirt on it. Nothing is ever perfectly clean. The dirt turns into mold. We have two days before the party begins. This is why basements and crawl spaces smell nasty because they're cooler than the rest of the house. And if you have a dew point that's at all close to danger zone, you're in trouble. So this is why dehumidification all the time is really important. Now, take that dew point from 70 to 55. Look, no risk. We just made it so that house is fine. Um, and 55, it's, that's not an exotic set point to get it to. But how do we deal with low cooling load but high humidity? Now we get to the magic. Now, to be clear, before I really dive into this, because uh, Tom, let's see, I want to pop his comment up. So Tom Leck. Um, so yes, there are VRF units, and then there's a lot of commercial stuff that has reheat. So we'll touch on that some, but in the residential space, it really doesn't hardly exist. So we're just looking at residential in this case. So here's what it looks like. The fix is 24 seven dehumidification capability with reheat. It's really simple in the end. Um, you take uh, warm or hot humid air, you put it into the air conditioner coil and you get cold and quite well dried air. Pay, don't pay attention to the relative humidity it's the dew point we care about. The dew point's now 50. We went from 70 to 50 right here. But the problem is, if there isn't much cooling load, we're going to overcool the space and we're going to get complaints, particularly from the ladies in the house, usually. And so what you want to do is add that heat back in or add the heat any way you can 
to get it to where we go from cold dry air to room temperature dry air. So a good way to look at this is picture you've got a sponge that's wet. When you put it through the air conditioner, you have squeezed the sponge, but you're holding it really small. So it looks like it might be wet, um, but it's because you're holding the, the sponge really, really tight. And then on the other side, when you add the heat back, you, you have a dry sponge on the other side. That's what we're trying to do with reheat. And there's two ways to do this. There's hot gas, which is where you run the refrigerant that got heated here back through the other coil. And then there's electric. So dehumidifiers fundamentally are hot gas reheat. Because you've got your first coil where you run the air through and it cools it. And then it runs back through and it goes through the second coil where it gets all the heat added back to it. So it comes out warm. Um, so dehumidifiers fundamentally are hot gas. Um, there's a... Lennox product called Humiditrol that I proposed twice on projects and both times the contractors went running for the hills. Um, very expensive, lots of complexity. They were scared about the second coil and the static pressure effects and like all of these other things. Like they, they couldn't say no fast enough. Um, they were not happy about that. Um, which leaves us to what our drastic preference is anyway, which is electric reheat. Sounds kind of crazy to run the heat strips and the air conditioner at the same time, but it, it's actually a pretty darn nice uh, solution to it. And here's what it looks like. It's really very simple. Um, like any heat pump that has resistance backup uh, can do this. You've got the indoor coil on an upflow. You've got the fan in the middle. You've got the airflow running up and the heat strips on the other side. And excuse me one moment. I need to blow my nose. You got to love having kids and getting sick. Right, Jeff? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, so that's what it looks like. Super simple. And the nice thing is with electric reheat, the strips, you know, the parts, what, 75 to 200 bucks, something like that. This is not an expensive part and it's already got a hole for it. And you always, you already really should run it because someday the compressor is going to go out. And now it's not an emergency. Um, it's on emergency heat, but it'll be okay. Um, and it, we like to size between heating and cooling. So oftentimes we need a little bit of backup when it gets really cold. And then sometimes it's going to get really freaking cold. And so having that extra oomph will make it so that the house doesn't slide. So it, having resistance strips, it's just good insurance on multiple fronts. And there's what it looks like. This is 15 kW running, um, which doesn't happen very often. So here's your reheat options. So you can have single stage reheat, which you can do with multiple um, basic, like one and two stage thermostats. There's a couple of them that do this. And that gives you, you can do anything between the 3 kW strip and a 20 kW strip. So that's 10,000 to 68,000 BTUs. Uh, works on basic systems. Curse is it can be noisy. So I have something kind of like that here. Um, I got an 824 American Standard thermostat with uh, integrated dehumidification. And it, it the programming sucks, frankly. You can't tell it that you have less strip. So it runs like it's got 15 kW strip. So it puts three tons of airflow through the air handler, but I only have two tons of ductwork. So it basically shakes the house. Meanwhile, the outdoor unit's only running at two thirds of a ton. So the coil's running like 75 degrees. Um, so there's no dehumidification going on. So it makes a bunch of noise and burns a bunch of energy, but doesn't really help. Um, they aren't all going to be like that, but that's, that's the experience that I had here. Uh, now train has two stage reheat. And so they, they have that with A24, but having used it until they improve it, I can't recommend it. But the 1050, both Tim Portman and uh, Stephen Rarden have used this. And so you can get a two stage, like five and 10 kW backup and run that with a modulating system that can control coil temperature. And this looks like it works pretty well. I haven't had any personal experience with this though. Uh, what I do have a great deal of experience with, and everyone here does too, is uh, the carrier ICP reheat. 
This is the sweetness right here. They have a three stage 369 backup. So 3KW, 6KW, 9KW. 3KW is 10,000 BTUs. That's about what both the two and the three ton units dial down to. So they can actually match. Uh, so Tanner, before the show, we were talking, um, uh, what, what, what's your experience with matching in the commercial systems that you work on? So for hot gas reheat, which is what you typically see in commercial spaces, it works as long as every, as long as you have a load within the space and as long as it can run and as long as it's not oversized and there's a lot of ifs and ands, but in scenarios like <clears throat> you have a low sensible load and you need the AC to actually run so it can dehumidify mm -hmm. the AC itself cannot reheat the airstream enough to be able to get an actual long run time. You're kind of just hope you're trying to get as just much temperature as you can. And you're just kind of hoping now in the commercial space, if you use some controls and this isn't what people usually want because people are terrified of running strip heat with ACs, mm -hmm. but I've done it and I've seen it done. You can actually dial the discharge air temperature to exactly what you want it because there's, there's been some scenarios where there would be a space where the or, original engineer design plans was like for a small computer lab. And so a computer lab generates a ton of sensible heat. So you need yeah. a big unit. So they end up putting in like a five ton split system, single stage. Well, then after it's built, the place decides, well, we're not going to do a computer lab. We're going to turn it to an office. So now this office space turns into where one person is going to be in maybe part of the time. And yet you've got five tons of air conditioning for a 200, 250 square foot space. And so in those scenarios, I've, scene where okay well we're just gonna have to go in use this 20 kw heat kit with an scr so we can dial in the voltage to the heat kit and then with those controls you can actually tell it i need this you know discharge temperature and that's really where the secret sauce is is that electric strip heat allows you to actually be able to run that ac without changing the indoor temperature whatsoever but you can dry it out you pretty much turn your ac into a dehumidifier and that's all it does Yep. Therefore, you get really good results. But basically, if you can't match the the strip heat or whatever the the reheat form is to what the uh, the the sensible um, cooling is, it becomes problematic. Exactly. Um, yep. And that's so that's where this three stage thing is super duper nice because like nine KW, if you're running a three ton unit, that's right about 30,000 BTUs. So, you know, that's probably like fourth stage somewhere in that range. So it can actually get kind of close. Or if you're running a fully modulating, um, uh, green speed, you can definitely uh, get there too. So you can get that room temperature dry air out the other side. So, um, this, this works really quite nicely. Um, it's also super quiet if you're only pulling three KW, which is what they normally default to. I've watched them run or the five, if you're running a five, 10, 15, um, running at that low airflow, they're super quiet. So lots of benefits there. So there's what is reheat. Next up you you will have heard, but it's expensive. It's not efficient. No, it's awful. The end of the world is near. Um, uh, like everything we need to look at data people. Um, don't argue over freaking specification sheets, go put one in and see what happens. So let's do this where, the, um, a bunch of us are going to go. Uh, so this is the house where we figured out reheat. So it's 1300 square feet. It was built in 1900. It started with a 3,300 blower door, got it down to 1800. And it, I, like I told, told about this one drove me nuts, um, getting there and it has a two ton green speed. So we put this in, in 2016. Um, and, uh, that's a Brian. I see I'm not a green speed fan. Uh, make, make a note. Why man? Um, you gotta give me more. Uh, electric reheat. This is the line you want to look at right here. So what I love about this stat, uh, there's a bunch of different things, but uh, if you have clients that are like, it, it, my electric bills are super high, uh, uh, you know, and they're, they're complaining about it. You can go look at this and most likely get yourself off the hook. 
Um, so like, I think I talked about it in previous episodes, but I caught one client growing pot and I'm like, all right, you need led grow lights. Um, and, uh, another client was running uh, a five horsepower, um, a pond pump 18 hours a day. So that was four or 500 bucks a month in electricity. He was all mad about it. And he's like, this is way higher in my other house and put an energy monitor in. And I knew that it wasn't the HVAC, but I didn't know for sure what it was until I found out. Yeah, it was the pond pump. Um, but pay attention to electric reheat. Oh, okay. Yeah. Carrier large amount. Um, look at Bryant's or the, the five stage system. If, if, uh, it makes sense for you. Um, I'm just seeing, uh, uh from, you get what you pay uh, for in notes. Yeah. There's that too. Well, and these, the, the green feeds are getting stupid expensive. They, well, can you do with ICP too? Um, only Bryant and carrier have the green speed. So in Bryant, it's the evolution extreme. Everybody else just gets the five stage. Um, but yeah, there's eight or 10 different brands. You can get the five stage um, and all the model numbers end in an eight. So like it's a VNA, VNA eight carrier. It's the 288 Bryant's and like all the other ones have an eight on them. So day and night and high and what are the, all, all the other ones. Green um, speed, green speed really is sort of a climate zone six device. Five and six. Yeah. Um, it is specific. I mean, you could probably, it's hard to justify the, the savings versus I'm just yeah. sort of thinking it through. If you're, if you're doing the balance, the cost benefit analysis, how much electricity are you going to burn because of below two degrees? Well, you get uh two grand from the government on the dumb thing now. Oh, um, right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Reedy, Reedy's had, had some experience with the Gree and they, they were all excited about that for a while, and then they decided they didn't like it. Yeah, it, it didn't do particularly well at dehumidification. So uh, all of the mini split outdoor units um, that are not fully communicating, which is darn near all of them right now. I mean, uh, Dyke and Fitz, the first one that comes to mind that is not, that is communicating. If it's just two-stage, they can't control the indoor coil temperature, and uh, they don't dehumidify for squat. So... You can learn the easy way right now from me, or you can go put one in and then eat installing a dehumidifier. Um, so your choice. Um, it, it, if you need to lo uh, you know, learn a $5,000 lesson, knock yourself out. Um, but uh, they suck. I'm, uh, I'm actually really freaked out about the federal IRA incentives for the heat pumps because the cheapest stuff that applies is that sort of product and it doesn't dehumidify. We were running like one to 10% um, uh, dehumidification versus sensible. It, we're going to get a lot of people sick and, and ruin a lot of houses with that. So be very, very careful with those products. Um, you heard it here first. I've been talking about this for a while and I've been screaming at, uh, um, policymakers. I actually had the people that, that, uh, worked on that policy. I chatted with them. They're like, so what can we do to improve this policy? And I said, delete it. Um, <laughs> because it's structurally bad. Like it's, you, you just built a building on a bad foundation. How do you make that building good? You either replace the foundation or you tear it down. There are no other options. Um, and it's, it's, it sucks. So anyway. Sorry to enough, derail us. Enough on um, that. You can go to, you can go to the smiley face thing and, <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah, I meant to put that see together. What that's all about and, that, and we'll show that later. Yeah. I actually, I forgot to put it together for this presentation. I, I did the other day, but, uh, Anyway, there's ways that you can do it and sell away from the, what qualifies. Don't ever start with uh, incentives anyway. Like it, it'll bite you. That's that, that puts the sales process in the wrong order. Um, so anyway, back to this. 2017, this is where we figured out how to turn reheat on. It used 178 kilowatt hours. So this is 10 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour for most of the country. So that's 20 to 40 bucks, something like that. But let's look at um, years when he was really living there and really using it. So, and this is the highest of any of the houses that I've seen under normal operation. But this house had a damp basement, damp. Um, so we had to do mold remediation when it was just sitting there. So it was wet enough to cause enough condensation just sitting there to mold up all of the, the joists in the basement. So this house has a lot of moisture coming up from underneath 
Uh, and Lake Erie is only about a half mile north of here. So it's in a humid climate too. So 715 kilowatt hours for the year in 2018. So that works out to 70 to 150 bucks, something like that. And uh, almost 900 kilowatt hours for 2019. And this is, I took this just after New Year's. So if you want to know what kind of uh, nerd I am, here I am just after the new year turned. And I knew that I could get a full year of two different years of energy use. And I screenshotted it like a couple of minutes later. That's a problem. All right. Um, <laughs> this is stuff that I watched very, very closely. Um, and so still 900 kilowatt hours for the year. That is hundred bucks, 200 bucks, something like that. Dehumidifiers cost at least that much to run. I routinely see them cost 40 to $60 a month to run in the summer. Just normal. Um, I don't blink an eye when I see those numbers. So oftentimes it costs more to run a DHU than it does the air conditioner. And actually I'm going to show that in a little bit. Here is another house. Um, so this is a condo in Youngstown. This surprised the heck out of me. This uh, condo was only worth 90 grand. She chose a $25,000 package. Just blew my mind. And this is uh, back in eight, it was 19, 19, we did this. So you, you need to go pre COVID pricing. $25,000 job three years ago was a big deal. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, she got a two ton green speed. And it's a little bit tough to see, but she used 151 kilowatt hours the first year it was installed in March of 2019. So 20 bucks, something like that for the year. And she doesn't have a separate dehumidifier in this house. So that's all it used. And Tim, I was hoping he might be here tonight. Uh, his daughter's probably being fussy. Um, but uh, Tim Narr. Uh, he is in Southeast Pennsylvania. This is an electrification that went from oil to two heat pumps, 1960s house, 2,800 square foot, uh, sorry, 2,800 blower door, 2,200 square feet. It has two, two ton, five stagers. Um, and what this started up in October and the screenshot was just from the other day. So there's nothing in 2023. We'll look for 2022. It used 96 kilowatt hours. And 104 kilowatt hours, 200 kilowatt hours of dehumidification for the year. 20 or 30 bucks. Oh, hey, there he is. Yeah, I was back. I was backstage or whatever. Uh, I'm glad Ted found you. Yeah. Uh, so, what what feedback have you gotten from the client on this? Make, make, uh, make that change to your microphone first. It's really scratchy. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. We figured out why his mic is scratchy. It's a setting, thankfully. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's way yeah. better. Okay. Um, so my feedback from my client was this is the most comfortable home they've ever lived in. And that, and they left me a glowing review on my uh, Google page. Um, and we still kind of maintain contact and zero complaints. So, you know, I think that's about as good as it can get. I don't mind those. I like those clients mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, Tanner, I think you're up next. Yeah. So this is a house that you did an encapsulation on, right? Yes. So this was one we actually, we changed the HVAC and we encapsulated the crawl space. Uh, we kind of did this in stages. So first we just replaced the HVAC equipment. And then later on in the year, this happened, I believe April ish of the year. And then towards the end of that year, we encapsulated the crawl space. And then the following year in the summer, the dehumidifier for the crawl space was added. It was a situation where he didn't want to add it right then. He wanted to wait and save up a little bit of money and he was going to do it right before spring hit. Well, he didn't do it. He waited till summer and we got it put in. But uh, anyways, for that, it was 1,800 square feet. Uh, we had a, It started with a 2,000 blower door, and we dropped it to 1,500 with the encapsulation. And this was a five-stage Bryant unit, so it's the 288 or the VNA-8 for carrier. And, yeah, this was, I mean, very little electric strip heat usage. Even with probably close to half of the year, the crawl space didn't have the dehumidifier. So yeah. oh, the reheat usage, yeah, is very low. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You said that the, so it was probably September or something before the DHU and the, the crawl space went in? 
uh, about 1st of July. Okay. Yeah. All right. So a good chunk of this was the reheat handling all of it without a separate DHU at all. Yes. Okay. Um, cause uh, by the way, Tanner's in Alabama. So, you know, the summer starts in April. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's three solid months. I mean, so that, that handled one shoulder season with 382 kilowatt hours of usage. So that's like 40 bucks, something like that. So, yes. you know, it, say it, it might be a hundred bucks for the year or something like that, or yeah. 150 bucks. Like it's, th these are not substantial sums. If a hundred bucks a year is freaking you out, you probably shouldn't be looking at $20,000 HVAC or probably even owning a home to be <laughs> frank. Um, this stuff shouldn't break you. That's the, you're, you're running awfully close yeah. to the edge. And which also to add to that, I forgot um, the way this house was being used. There was four people that lived there. And so there was quite a bit of showers that was taking place, but also uh, the guy that owned it, his girlfriend at the time, she did a lot of baking and a lot of cooking. She would bake stuff and sell it. And so in their house, I mean, they're cooking basically nonstop, whether it's to sell or, and they pretty much, they never eat out. They constantly eat in. And so, I mean, okay. there's a lot of moisture generation that happens yep. just from them using it. And, and depressurization. Well, is, does the range hood vent outside? No, it did not vent okay. it into the attic. Well, but the attic's not encapsulated, right? No. Although right, that's... So the outside. <laughs> yeah. No, for the most part. <laughs> um, uh, just curious, because I, I mean, that that if you depressurize the house at a couple hundred CFM, that's a lot of latent that you're adding to by sucking it back in. Um, yes. Plus the cooking latent. So, so key point here is it's not crushing anyone. And a lot of this is because this system can drop down nice and low. So if you're getting 50-50 or close to it, dehumidification and uh, sensible cooling, that's oftentimes enough to balance it correctly. So you don't need extra dehumidification in addition to that. All right. Reedy um, uh, was not feeling super well tonight, so he's not here. And... Um, but this is his house, and we, we kept bopping him over the head. Reedy, you should put a green speed into your house. And he did. Um, and uh, so for the whole year last year, he used 6,064 kilowatt hours. His electric reheat usage, and he's in North Carolina, so pretty humid climate, 663 kilowatt hours. So again, you know, 70 bucks to 140 bucks. Um, eh. Um, like not a huge, huge deal. A couple more of mine. So I'm going to show these are the worst ones that I have. Uh, so this one, I felt kind of dumb. I should have asked one extra question and I didn't. So this is a house that was built in 2018. Very tight. It's the one that we looked at. This got to be two Pascal's positive with a uh, fresh air duct. Um, 2,200 square feet, four ton, five stage. And what I did wrong on this was I set the reheat to 46% relative because I knew their preferences were for a little bit higher temperatures. So I figured they were going to let the house sit without being occupied at, say, 75 degrees. Well, they set it at 70. 70 degrees and 40% relative is fairly low. And then the house was new built. So we were sucking all the moisture out of the basement walls on top of all that. So I got a phone call, Nate, we got a $150 bill, um, on this house. Oh, I need to go up a slide here. So 1,278 kilowatt hours got a, this was all in one month or almost all, there might've been a hundred in the, the month after. Um, uh, but Nate, we got a, a bill for 150 bucks in a, in a tight house. that's supposed to be super insulated and efficient and we're not living there yet. What's going on. And I had them go get a picture of this and that's what the problem was. So we bumped it to 52% as the target. And look, the, the next year it's zero. But here is the whole year, the screenshot. I'm putting screenshot dates down here so that everybody can see that I'm not just making stuff up. Um, 26 kilowatt hours for the year. So the, this five-stager was doing a nice job on this house. And once the house was dry and because it was tight, it didn't have a huge amount of latent load from outside to deal with. It basically just had to deal with internal loads. 
Now, this is the worst one that I have. This is my cousin's house. So, um, uh, ranch built in 1960, 2,500 square feet, or sorry, 2,500 CFM 50, 1,600 square feet. We did a two ton five stager in this. And uh, it, he had had his internet router break. And this was a pretty early electrification for me. He was number four, or number five. And uh, so I wanted to get internet on it so I could watch what his system was doing. And his router had just broke. So I bought him a router and took it over and installed the thing. And then he shut his internet off the next month and I never had any access. And a little while later he calls me, Nate, look at this. Like it's what heat pump heating, 4,800 kilowatt hours, electric reheat, 4,200. So when you hear the stories of, Oh geez, this is terrible. It's using a ton of energy. Like this is a ton of energy, but look how he was operating the house. And because I didn't have any access, I would have caught this early on. I would have caught it within a week, probably, if uh, I saw high usage every day. So he was doing the old school trick of running the air conditioner during the day. And when he, when, uh, he went to bed, opening the windows. Uh, the problem with that is when it's 70 degree dew point outside, which is normal in Cleveland, Akron area for a bunch of the, the year, all of that moisture runs in through the windows like the blob, if you've ever seen the movie and soaks into all the building materials. And then you close the windows in the morning, turn the air conditioner on, and it works all day trying to get that moisture back out, um, including using a bunch of reheat. And then like Sisyphus, you come home and you open the door, and you give it all that moisture to deal with again. So this is what happens when you operate a house wrong at the end of the day. Um, and had I had yeah, access I would say to it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need wind, does it? <clears throat> No, it doesn't need wind. All, all it needs is a, a delta. It pours in sort of like, like water. Moisture yep. pours in like water. Exactly. So uh, this is how you shouldn't run it. So I'm like, all right, because um, let's let's just shut this off because it is not good with how you like to operate your house. Um, and you can see that he hasn't used any since then. Now, uh, by the way, you see a lot of electric resistance heat here. We sized his heat pump to where his house was going, not where it is. So I need to check where he is now because he has since insulated his walls and dealt with his rim joists. So in the loads, we, we chose this with uh, where he was going. So a three ton might have been uh, better for him for those couple of years, but it should be pretty good now. Now, this is Did the he other. Did you have for a three ton? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, he did. He, he's okay. one that freaked me out. I think he was 0.12 on high. Um, and 0.04 on low. Um, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to work, but that was the second house I'd had like that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to let her rip. Um, call me if there's a problem. I'll help you adjust the dampers. So yeah, he probably had four, four and a half tons of ductwork. Three wouldn't have been a problem. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, this is another client who didn't want to connect his stat to Wi-Fi because Google is big and evil, which there may be some truth to, but also... <laughs> Um, I couldn't watch to see what the hell was going on. So I had to bother him for screenshots. And so I bother him every so often. And then one day he's like, I just got solar and the reheat's using a whole bunch of juice. How can we minimize this? I'm like, well, it's good to know now. <laughs> like I had no idea. Um, so he used 300 kilowatt hours in August and 198 in September. I'm pretty sure this was last year. Um, so we backed him from like a 48% set point to like a 52. And that I, I haven't heard any more. Can I tell you more? But I don't know. And I'd show you annual, but he didn't send it to me, even though I asked. Um, so what am I supposed to do? Um, if, if I don't have any way to understand what's going on and help you commission and adjust, I can't help you. So this is why we like these tools where you can see what's going on because it, it, I mean, th this was a quick text conversation and we fixed it, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but um, let's take a step back. So we're just talking about what reheat uses, but dehumidifiers use juice too. So this is my XT 155. This is in the basement of my old house and it pulls 770 Watts, um, it's about a hundred of that is the fan and uh, 150 and about 600 of it is the compressor, which considering how big it is, that's a hell of a deal because um, even just like smallish ones use about 600 Watts I'm talking to 50 or 70 pint. So that one was using four kilowatt hours per day, pretty consistently. 
So that's 120 kilowatt hours per month. Um, so that's easily in the three, four, 500 per year range, which is what we've been looking at with reheat, right? Now let's look at this house. So this was built in 1994. It's got a 1500 blower door. It's 1150 square feet. It's just a little guy. Um, uh, it's, we would have preferred actually to get something slightly different, but it's in a beautiful place and it was in our price range. So we bought it. Uh, I put a three ton Bosch 20 sear in here and it has a TEM six air handler. And frankly, I regret this decision. Um, cause it acts as a two stage. The coil doesn't get cold enough. It doesn't hardly dehumidify. If I flip the settings so that it does dehumidify, it runs essentially as a one stage and shuts off really quick. Um, so I have, I have no way to make this system run the way that I want it to run. And like I explained earlier, the reheat doesn't work the way that I want it to. So this was a failed experiment in my mind. It's not that I wouldn't use this product ever, but uh, I, I oversized it really for this planning on it, being able to run. Okay. At 25% capacity. And it just doesn't end up working that way in heating. It goes to almost a hundred percent. Uh, even when I have the airflow dialed all the way back. Um, so, um, uh, it's, I don't like this unit, unfortunately. Um, but take a look at, this is the washer and dehumidifier. So it's one outlet and um, I have to have the thing pushed up against it. So it's not easy for me to split this thing and see what's going on. But the vast majority of this 1,384 kilowatt hours, which this is the 2022 usage, the vast majority of this is the DHU. The washer only uses about a quarter per kilowatt hour per run. So it's almost nothing. Um, it doesn't really matter. So let's take a look. Reedy, you made it, buddy. Hello. Uh, glad to see your face. Yes, Reedy I'm was glad. in an accident a couple of weeks ago. So uh, um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I am so happy to see you regardless. Um, nothing can stop Big Daddy Reedy. No, ain't nothing. <laughs> um, so uh, here, here, oh, there, <laughs> super awesome guy. I love that you put that there. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, all right. So July uh, at my house, the heat pump or the air conditioner used 231 kilowatt hours. So this is like 25 bucks or well, it's we're, we're more than that. It's more like 30 uh, for cooling in the hottest month of the year. So not half bad. So yeah, that's pretty efficient. I'll give you that. But the stupid dehumidifier used almost as much power. So this is probably 200 uh, dehumidifier. And then if you look at September, which is shoulder season, look, the DHU used more power than the air conditioner. So it's a good thing that I have an efficient air conditioner. Um, in a lot of ways, I would prefer like an old school eight sear for the air conditioning side. Another story for the heat pump. But let's take a look at my client that was complaining. So 308 in August, but look, 198 in September versus 187 for me. These numbers are not that drastically different. Now, it, this is a bigger house. There's a bunch of other things going on. Um, uh, so is it exactly comparable? No. But talking orders of magnitude, we're within the same order. So reheat is not breaking the bank. So let's take a look at the strategies and what they cost. So we can do basic dehumidifier. So that's 250 to 500 bucks. We can get a ventilating DHU, which is two to three grand for the unit plus parts and install, which usually works out to six to 10 by the time you're done with it all. And then we can do electric reheat, which is included. Basically, if you're installing the system, you're already putting in everything that you need. Now the draw, how much do they pull? 300 to 600 watts is usually what you see out of the basic DHUs. So two and a half to six amps at 110. Um, the ventilating DHUs are 100 to 200 for the fan, 200 to 600 for the compressors. So comparable to get more out of them. Um, and electric reheat, and this is where people start getting stuck. Um, they're like, uh, but we're running the air conditioner which at one ton is a thousand Watts, three tons is 3000 Watts. And then your resistance backup is 3000 to 15,000 Watts. So people get stuck on this and think, Oh geez, the world's going to end. It's going to be awful. We just look through the numbers. The numbers aren't that hideous. 
And so when you look at what your annual usage is, uh, basic DHU 500 to 2000, a ventilating DHU might be a little bit less um, to about the same. Can I, and, can I stop you here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think you might want to mention at this point, the issue of it not being nonlinear. Like if you're setting your, your relative humidity target to 49, 48 or 50%, um, it's going to be similar to the ventilating DU and the basic DU. If you set it to 43, um, you could have some really big bills. I mean, but, but you have the power to get you there with reheat. Yeah. You don't have the power to get yourself there with a ventilating DU. I think you're going to talk about some of that stuff later. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of factors in here. And by the way, I'm just to tackle question here, John White is asking, how do you implement it? It's a couple of settings. It takes about five minutes. Um, it's really not a big deal. Uh, you just have to know which buttons to push. There's another button that if you push, knocks out about 30% of your annual usage. It's all built into the carrier and ICP controller. Yep. Yeah, and which what something that a lot of people miss, even if you've been installing in carrier infinity, the green speeds or the bright units is after you go through the commissioning process or the install process, I should say, you have to go back into the settings to go find those things to change. People think that, Oh, once you do the setup and everything's up and, and it starts up and running, you're good. No, there's actually, and what sucks is in the actual book, it's not clear. It doesn't tell you, Hey, you need to go do this. They just kind of go, well, it's there. Maybe you can figure it out on your own because we don't like you. And so you just got to figure it out for yourself. Somewhere Nate has um, a video of, of commissioning a thermostat. I, yep. I think that's your channel, Ted, and I think it's private. Yep, that one's private because that's there's a lot of secret sauce there. That took a long yeah. time. So call me and <laughs> we'll go from there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's just a bunch of little settings. Subscribe uh, to HVAC 2O and we can talk. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, so that, that's the kind of stuff that we discuss within the guild because you're looking at a good chunk of the guild right here. Um, but key takeaway from this is the operating costs are pretty similar. Like maybe it's a bit more, but it's included. So you don't have to pay extra for it. You just have to know how to turn it on. So reheat dehumidification, but the money so let's assume it's worst case and everybody's like my cousin um, who, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have Wi-Fi. I can't watch what's going on. I hear a year later that something went sideways. Let's say that he never calls me and it costs him 400 bucks a year extra uh, for reheat versus what it would for maybe a dehumidifier. Over 10 years, that's four grand. That buys you half of a ventilating dehumidifier and you're probably going to need two. Mm-hmm. You're still saving a shit ton of money. Um, the, so, and this is where when people are, it's arguing over spec sheets, that stuff drives me nuts. Let's look at the actual numbers. Um, go put something in and learn. That's how we learn stuff. I mean, that's why I did the Bosch here. I wanted to learn. I didn't want to do it on a client home. I did it on my own and I regret the damn decision. Um, uh, but uh, this I know works. So assume the best case scenario, no extra reheat cost over 10 years. You just saved your client something like 10 or $20,000 on their system. Or if you, uh, yeah, let's, that's five grand to 10 grand um, times two. And uh, um, Tim, oh, forgive me, Tim. My mind is totally blanking on your last name. Um, in North Carolina. Dang it. I hate it when that happens. Um, Tim asked me about wear and tear from reheat. And the answer is, I don't really know, but these systems are, they're, they're largely kind of set up where they last X number of cycles. So if they don't cycle too often, yep. Yeah. There you go. Tanner train definitely has reheat. Uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, oh, that's the Brian's question of what if I don't do carrier, you can look at uh, the ICP brands. Um, cause they, they all have this in the five stager. Um, that's the 288 or the VNA eight that I was talking about. Um, but if a system lasts a certain number of cycles, how many extra cycles is reheat going to trigger? So if you have like that carrier system that can run nice and low, it may not trigger many extra cycles at all. So it, it, 
my bet is it doesn't have a substantial effect on uh, the, the lifespan. And then the other thing is resistance. How often have you seen resistance strips fail in well-installed systems? If they're short on airflow, yeah, they're going to burn up. But if they actually have airflow, I mean, I've seen 40 and 50 year old systems where the original strips are still running. Um, I mean, th that, that's a pretty good technology. It's like electric motors. If you're nice to them, they just keep going. So if you have fear of high reheat costs, take a chill pill. As the kids used to say, <laughs> that was, well, that's what I used to say. Uh, so zero to 150 bucks a year extra is realistically what you're looking at for reheat versus a ventilating dehumidifier but it saves installing that extra piece of equipment. And oftentimes you don't have a good place to put it. Like Tanner was talking about that last week. Like where the hell are you going to put it? Um, like there just isn't space. Uh, you know, you have a small mechanical room in a basement or you don't have much space in the garage or the attic. I mean, these things are a pain to get in there. I have a DHU on my house. I, I cut a hole for a window so I could get it in there. That's how I got in, because um, where the where I'd like to open the hatch up, I'm like, oh, good, I'll just cut this open and I'll put some pull down stairs, and half the wiring for the house is running right through that space. I'm not going to rewire everything. I'm like, fine, I'm running a window. So sometimes you just don't have space. So in general, sorry to the folks that are uh, whining about this, but stop whining. Um, <laughs> just follow the data and see what's going on. It'll, it'll be okay. And again, what am I doing? With sky is the limit, use whatever I want. This is a fairly low load house, so I don't need an absolute top of the line heat pump. If this was an old leaky house like my old one, I'd want a green speed. It's not. I don't need the killer low temperature performance. I'll burn an extra 100 bucks a year in resistance, whatever. Um, I don't care. It's a resistance house entirely right now, so I'm looking forward to the bills when I do this. Um, and Tanner, you'll be doing the duct design, as you know. So one of these days, um, now limitations to reheat, it, uh, only works in cooling. So if it's 65 or 70 degrees out and you don't have it in cooling mode and you've got high dew points, you got trouble. The basement may not get dehumidified. This was a problem in Paul Schultz's house and then carrier doesn't work well with zoning. So the fixes to these are in, install a small $250 dehu. And because it's only running a little bit, they typically last three to five years instead of one or two. Because I don't know if anybody's had uh, bad luck with these, but man, uh, we just burn through DHUs anymore. Um, if ever I see a good deal on a DHU, I just grab it because um, I know sooner or later I'm going to need it. Um, uh, in the basement, if it's not dehumidifying, put a return down there. This is one reason that I like electrification because I don't have natural draft equipment anymore. If you have natural draft, don't do this. Um, or measure, be very careful that you're not depressurizing and backdrafting. And then for the carrier issue, avoid zoning. We almost always end up disconnecting zoning for client homes if it's two zones or three zones. Um, zoning is a crappy fix to a crappy problem. The, the problem is the wrong HVAC and probably a bad shell. Um, friends don't let friends do zoning. Right, or by single stage. <laughs> crap's awful. So now we've run through that and spent a bunch of time on that and we're running longer than I meant to. So um, anyway, we'll get this finished up. So all of this comes around this whole series. What's the best mid-price system we can install? And we talked about zero maintenance. So do we want to do extra equipment? John just said to confirm you can do reheat with the green speed or the uh, five stage carrier Bryant heat pumps. Yes, you can. Um, you just need to know how to do it. If you go to natethehousewhisperer.com, um, the contact page, if you want to buy an hour, um, that's enough for me to set, set everything up if you happen to have one. Um, it's by far my favorite and Ted's favorite piece of equipment. And I think just about everybody else here, I think we've ended up dragging everybody along behind us because of all the little things it does. So extra equipment, if we're trying to do a, uh, a nice but reasonably priced uh, system. This is not what we want. These add five to $10,000 each. 
We don't want to do any of these things. We need to do everything with one system if we can. So all of these systems. Let's make it clear. We, we got to separate out the ERVs. We really don't want ERVs. Oh, yeah. These are stupid. <laughs> yeah. Basically, under no circumstances do you need an ERV in a single family home. Um, that's just dumb. Uh, ventilating DHU, there are lots of use cases where they can be nice. But all those two systems, well, in particular, the ERVs, those are for full home performance boneheads. It's people that are obsessing over small details that don't actually matter at the end of the day. And then uh, what happens is you drive the cost of the project up so much that nobody buys. And if nobody buys, you have knowledge unapplied, which is useless. So and your family is, doesn't eat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's, it, it just sucks. And I mean, it, it, this is the home performance world. Like it, Ted and I are former home performance boneheads. 100%. We dug into all the stupid stuff. We argued over asinine, stupid things, and then nobody did the work. And then we went out and, well, T Ted had done the work, and then he taught me how to do the work. And we start doing the work, and like, uh, so this is stupid, and this is stupid, and this is smart. And like, we tracked learning. energy use. We tracked yeah. energy use and got very good at energy modeling to the point where we could, we could predict within 5% over and under. Yep. So, so suddenly you realize, Oh, well, if this is what people's energy opportunity. Yeah. And there usually isn't that much. So the answer is like we've talked about before and what you guys can feel free to start chiming in here. You want to be the guide and not the hero. So if you are the guide and you're showing your client homeowner, the building science and the various technical things that are going on and like what they can expect for different budgets and things, they are making their own choices as they go. <clears throat> and what you're doing the whole time there is you are offering and declining. So if you offer somebody a bunch of options and decline all of them, and then they complain that something didn't happen that they expected to happen, you can point back to their signature. They own it. Um, you just responsibly avoided responsibility. Um, this is important. Like the, the stuff that you need to own, own. But there's a lot of stuff that we really shouldn't own. Because um, if you buy crappy equipment and you get crappy results, well, that's what you paid for. Um, but we need to educate people to expect that to be coming. So we want to give them as many of the six functions of HVAC as makes sense. And like we've talked about a couple times, the 2.0 process has two fundamental questions. The first one is, are there problems to solve? And we ask four questions on a sliding scale. And if they lean no, they do a free quote and they get a simple replacement. And if they say yes, they get a comfort consult, which is more advanced. But if they do a free quote, you give them uh, options that look like this. Four different systems um, with four different installs. Uh, or you can do actually three to five, whatever you like. And which also to kind of clarify one other thing, when it comes to responsibly avoiding responsibility and applying that, that doesn't mean, well, actually I should back up. You could look at this and be like, okay, so carrier makes an amazing product and it has this electric reheat and it works fabulous. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't just run to every homeowner and then tell them, oh no, you have to buy this. This is the greatest thing ever. This is going to solve all your problems. Sometimes people are going to make dumb decisions. They're going to buy the single stage unit and then they're going to need a whole house dehumidifier after the fact in that scenario, like you're going to have to be very clear up front. That's where what he was showing before for the four different options. You want to be very clear as to what happens if the option they pick doesn't pan out. Okay. If you pick this first option and it doesn't work out, are you okay of having to come back and put in a whole house dehumidifier? Yeah. Laying it out. You're like willing that. to take that risk. So long as it's not your fault that they made that decision, then again, it's your responsibility to feed your family, not to yeah. protect people from decisions that you're not qualified to make. Maybe they're going to be there a year. Maybe they're going to be there two years. I mean, and they're going to put up with a discomfort or they're going to go get a dehumidifier from Walmart. All of those are their decisions. Yes. You're, well, you're doing it not just for yourself, but for them. This isn't, you don't responsibly avoid mm -hmm. responsibility so you can go to court and hold up and, you know, have an ironclad defense. You're doing it to avoid going to court to begin with. Cause yes. I know that's the, that's the direction people tend to go straight. Oh, if that's not going to hold up in court and it's like, well, if it, you shouldn't be in court because yeah. before they, when they, when they're making the decision, if they're making a bad decision and you know it ahead of time, 
and there could be a bunch of different, I mean, they, they could have a very good reason for making a bad decision happens all the time. They don't have the budget. They don't know what they're going to do. They think, and they're moving in a year who knows, but if you just pre-set up of, okay, well, if we go with this option, if we go with the single stage unit and we just and do lock for lock, we don't size it properly and we have high humidity, just so you know, we may have to come in and spend a quite, a, quite a bit more money to kind of get you comfortable. Are you okay with that? It's the them understanding this is what's going to happen. That's what is, that's the real magic sauce is that they understand that if something goes wrong, they know what to expect. They don't get blindsided by, well, I didn't see this coming because you've got to be very clear ahead of time. It's all about being extremely clear and doing it for their sake, not just yours. Yep. Yep. You're just trying to treat them like adults at the end of the day. Um, it's, here's what we can do. Um, which one do you want? So Brian is saying, or add reheat if it's the wrong system. So only if it's a heat pump only system for starters, so for me in the North, we don't have heat pump only systems for the vast majority of them. And like that's, that is a, not an easy, um, aftermarket Frankenstein. Yeah. So it's not an easy Frankenstein thing. Like there's, there really isn't a good option. And even if you do, if you have single stage, it's still like, it's okay. And I, I think the Honeywell 8,000, if you put it in commercial mode, does it? And there's one or two other ones that do it. But keep in mind, you are running a, a good size system flat out at that point. So you can get into some serious energy use. And like you need to make sure that it's programmed well. Like the air conditioner needs to run for at least five minutes to get that coil temperature down before the strip heat starts kicking. So we're like the 824 here, it kicks the strip and then it turns on the air conditioner. That's totally backwards. <laughs> um, uh, you're just burning a crap ton of energy before that coil ever gets cold and starts dehumidifying. Um, so the, the programming on all the single stage stuff, it, you try it, but the little bit that I've played with, I've been horribly disappointed. So typically the only good fix to the wrong system is a new system. Which we do a lot. We see a lot yeah. of this. You know. Yeah, I've, I've pulled out multiple two or three year old systems. Je Jeff, you, like you made a habit of that, dude. Um, you got all these new, uh, new built homes, you know, built in the past two, three, four, five years. How many have you pulled out? Hundreds. Uh, I would say hundreds over hundreds the last of over the last eight years. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, Br Brian, there is no great answer, but I'd say go try it. Um, and like, I haven't tried it enough to say that absolutely. Yeah. And report back. Tried it. Yeah, so try it and let us know. That's um, kind of what this channel's about is, is figuring this stuff out. Yeah. yeah. Um, Honeywell Correct. 8,000 boo. Suck it up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> not many, not many products have the feature and I'm not saying it's programmed well either sequenced well. Um, it is what it is. Yeah. Which uh, the, Brian this, and John's question though, it does kind of point to really the, the biggest pitfall for electric reheat is that there's only two manufacturers that have it towards already in within their equipment. Yep. And that's never going to change until people really start asking for it from the manufacturer. When you're at yeah, HR going up to them and saying, Hey, Doc, why don't you have electric reheat? And then, I, Hey, Tanner, them, you know why that? you, you want to know why? Why's that? Cause they can sell you a dehumidifier. <laughs> Cheers to that. That's, that's the only reason. I've talked to yep. other manufacturers and they don't care. They're not going to add it. They've actually defeatured it and they have no plans of adding it back. Yeah. Which is why if a lot of people start asking it in a way of like, Hey, um, it's really stupid that you don't have it. Why don't you? And then make them give you an answer. And then if and you don't even have to make the argument, just send them this video and then they'll get to this point to where they hear me talking. And then I can say, Hey, you're an idiot. Tanner Dickerson oh. <laughs> called me an idiot. That's it. We're going to totally redo the entire line. That's um, the PG version. Yeah. You can one fill hour in the gap. Use your creativity because that's what <laughs> I really need. Hey, one hour, 13 minutes, and 45 seconds. That's all we need to send to him. Yes. Just <laughs> send them that timestamp. Absolutely. <clears throat> oh, that's hilarious. So if, if, if someone does the comfort consult, almost all of these, so it's the it answers the second question, which is HVAC alone likely to solve the problem. Almost everyone does a tailored replacement. 
in that case, you probably wouldn't even show them the whole range because you will have had a discussion. So you're going to give them probably two or three options. And so you're probably going to be looking at better and best. Um, I mean, well, you, any- if you, if you get a feeling for the client too, you, you're going to know kind of where they are. Yeah. Like on budget, budget. and such things. And, and so it might be good and better. Always do the best though. So that you've covered your ass. Yep. Oh, one of the, so Brian, I'm glad you mentioned this. Bosch was okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Green <laughs> is my now. Um, again, if, if it's not communicating though, well, but Reedy, can you talk to, have you been having some, some challenges with Greek? Cause you put a bunch in last year. Yeah. Um, Brian, we did quite a few grease and it seems good for the two ton, three ton matchup. But when you get to that four ton, five ton, they had a problem with the motors. Um, something about high temps on the motors, even if you did have nice low static, like we mm-hmm. always do. Um, it just doesn't seem to work well. The two tons work okay. No, uh, no, no reheat, of course. But uh, the four tons and five tons, it's a little bit of a challenge. It has been for us. Okay. Um, have you watched humidity in any of them? Are they doing okay? They, I haven't, I haven't tracked it. No one's complained, but I haven't, okay. I haven't tracked it. Okay. My, my concern there is that it's not going to run a cold enough coil because it's not fully communicating. Um, right. That you want to make sure that that indoor unit slows that fan all the way down um, as needed. It's run on the edge of turning into a block of ice. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be the trouble unless you have reheat is that you're going to be freezing cold. That's that's all. That's all they can do. So you're going to be freezing cold. Well, there's reheat on the one hand, but you also need communication so that you can control the indoor uh, coil temperature with fan speed in addition to adjusting the outside. So I don't know that good reheat is possible without communication. I'm, I'm open to be proven wrong. Um, but from what I'm seeing, I don't know that it's possible. I, I don't think it is either. I have a VNA four at my house. Um, I tried some rigged up method and, uh, you know, it, it used a lot of energy and, uh, I still didn't feel good. So yeah, mm-hmm. you're exactly right. You got to have the VNA eight or VNA four, and communication. Brian, if you if you don't have communication, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get that fan speed down to the the CFM down to 325 CFM. If you don't have that, you're not going to be able to do it. So Brian, you're going to be in cognitive dissonance for a while here. If there's one one bit that I can. Uh... Uh, encourage you on um, view what we do like a practice like doctors do so as you learn you 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 shift gears and like don't feel bad about what you've done in the past just uh, take what you've learned now and move forward with that and don't do it again um, so um, um, you need the proper details for the house that's what a comfort consult's for dude <laughs> Um, you get a, a blower door, you see their energy use, you, uh, understand their zonals, which rooms leak. Um, you know, there's, there's all those sorts of things. Oh, that's, that's hilarious. Um, and, <laughs> um, uh, there's a, it, th- there's a bunch there. So, but if it's a free quote, you're not going to know the house. Um, like don't do free consulting. That's like the whole point of the process is if it's a free quote, it, you, here's the same size stuff you got in four different uh, pieces of equipment, four different installs. Which one do you want? I think um, people are going to really love the free quote because it'll help. It'll help you guys stay out of trouble yeah. in the sales process yeah. and, and very gently explain to the homeowner that, you know, I'm here to give you a free quote, which means that I don't know anything about your house and you're giving me a specification of what to install. Now, if you want to do design work together, there's a process we have where we can do some diagnostics and get an understanding of the house and get an understanding of issues that you'd like to see improved and, 
And it's just, it's going to take a little bit of time and I need to use a blower door and we're going to do some, I'll do a little bit of energy modeling. And then I'm going to go away and think about things. I'm going to leave my sales per person hat in the car for this, whole home, this, this comfort consult. And, uh, you know, but, but the free quote, I think, will help you because of the comfort consult that, that you have the ability to offer the comfort consult. It allows you to not get screwed when you're on the free quote. Yep. You got to have boundaries. It's, it's, I mean, my, my dad had narcissistic personality disorder. You had to have really freaking hard boundaries. Um, and every time you let someone cross that boundary, uh, something not good happened. So the problem is right now, if you don't have a paid option besides a free quote, you don't have a boundary where you can stop the free consulting from happening, where if you say, okay, this, this is it. And it's, this is free and we're going to do this, this, and this, and that's all. Um, uh, and then if you need more than that, we have this other process, which is paid and we can do that, but you have a boundary now that you can actually put in place. Um, so never get stuck trying to fix little Johnny's room. Um, uh, that, that's the goal. Um, not unless you're getting paid, get paid for what you know. Um, we, all of us here have spent years learning what we're doing. Um, get paid for what you know. So yeah, although, because, here I am. go ahead, Reed. Be, because to know the proper details of the house, you're going to have to do a blower door. You're going to have yep. to sit down. You're going to have to ask questions. You're going to have to, you know, know these things and you have to decide how much is too much. And so if you decide early on that a free quote is a free quote, and this is what you get like for like, and, a, and more you're going to pay, then you're going to save yourself everything because you get sued one time for being here and telling somebody something that's true. That's not really, and you'll figure it out real quick. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. The, I mean, the mechanism really that underlines us the reason that it'll work is you have to have the option to offer them because yes. you're going to run into a lot of situations and everyone's probably already done it a million times of you go out and the homeowner feels like that they have just this simple question that it's really easy. If you can just answer this for me, it'll help me out a ton. And we, I mean, you should understand that there is no such thing as a simple question because you have to answer several other questions beforehand before you can answer that question. And so if you don't already have something like in your back pocket to say, yeah, I have an option for you and it's called blank. We call it the comfort consult. You call it whatever. If you don't have that to be able to offer to them, well then now you kind of have to do your free. If you say you give free estimates and they have questions about what they want to buy. Well, yeah, you kind of have to give free information away because you don't ever, you don't have an alternative. But if you have that thing, you can pull out and go, oh, yeah, if you have pro I mean, if you go back to the flow chart, is there problems to solve? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, well, then you go comfort consult. And that's where we begin to solve this. But if you don't have any problems, well, then we can go free quote. And so you're make you're really making them ask, answer that question. And the reason it'll protect you is at first, if they have questions, because and it seems like they have issues and you offer it to them and they're like, oh, no, well, I don't want to pay or you know, okay, so you don't have any problems. Is that right? Oh yeah, I don't have any problems. I just want the free quote. And you make them tell you that and you go, okay, well, just so you know, if we go this route and you do have issues, the next step is the comfort consult and make them go, okay, well, that's fine. So then if now they've made a, if they've made a bad decision and now they're going to come back to blame you, you can go, okay, well, does that mean that you're ready for the comfort consult? You know, like what we discussed and I've mentioned to you multiple times. They're not going to be like pointing fingers saying, well, you didn't tell me that. Or if they do, you can just show them. Well, yeah, I, I did. But here's if three you're emails. To, yeah. yeah. And your signature. Exactly. <laughs> and if you're ready to move forward with that and then see what they do, are they going to continue their, you know, pointing fingers at you charade? No, they're going to be like, okay, yeah. I, and they, and if they, if that happens, they know they're wrong. They're just trying to see if they can bulldoze you, you know, are you going to, just crumple up and give them free stuff. That's what they're going to try to do. But if you have that foundational thing, that's what kind of keeps you safe. Amen. Well, well said, Rich. Well said. Um, 
<laughs> Rich is a good, good friend of both mine and Tanner's. So that that's funny. Yeah, it's you. You have to offer the fat or the the um, the forks. So this is choose your own adventure. Like we talked about last week, you can do this or you can do this. Um, here's the likely ramifications of this. Here's the likely ramifications of that. Here's the prices for them. Which one's best for you? And every time they make that choice, they own more and more of the responsibility. Um, so that's, it, it's, it's a tricky thing. And it's, it's a major mindset shift. Like this took me forever because I always wanted to sell the comfort consults. And then the only way I made money, I only did this, the comprehensive planning process. I didn't want to sell them HVAC because I hadn't figured out a good way to make money on that. I wanted to do these big projects. Um, but the nice thing is, as HVAC contractors, it, whatever happens here, look, you sell HVAC, look, you sell HVAC, look, you sell HVAC, like <laughs> all of these lead to good things. If you're an HVAC contractor, um, it was another thing for me as an independent consultant, And that made me want to sell. The whole point here is there's no selling. You are only offering and explaining the options. And then they are choosing. If you sell, you are taking some of that responsibility. Um, just offer them. And it's, it, it's a weird change because like it took me forever um, to, to get around to that in my own head. But anyway, finishing out the series, this simple system here tackles everything that we need. So for fresh air coming in from outside, we have fresh air coming in, we have really good filtration, and we have uh, 24 seven or nearly so, like I said, there's the, when you're in heat mode, but like 60 to 70 degrees, um, that's a challenge. Uh, but nearly so you have 24 seven dehumidification capability. So this just has one high end piece of equipment here, but I mean, this is a damper. That's a hundred bucks. You got the controller for a hundred to 400, you know, depending if you're running like a Haven or just a regular uh, controller, um, media filter, filter boxes aren't that much. Um, uh, going from an eight by 24 to a 24 by 24. I mean, it's not like tin is free anymore. It felt that way for a while. It's definitely not anymore, but that's not a ton of money. Um, and we already talked about this is included. So this is not an exotic system and a lot of people will buy it. And everyone here has installed the system. And in fact, uh, if anybody's seen the, like the badass drawing and, and this is the house that I was showing where the, the client got solar and uh, then was complaining about the, the reheat costs. This is the system that turned into the drawing. So it's 180 reverse, but that's, that's where this came from. Um, and note that's got some nice little features. If you can see these little screw holes here, these are turning vanes. Um, this is piped in pretty nice. Um, it's, it's a pretty nice looking install. Here's the back of it. Look at, they, they ran it as big as they could within the return, uh, plenum. And then they, they opened it out so that it hit the filter full face. Look how big that filter is. Um, so, and this is a three ton system. So, but is anything here exotic? I mean, it's just a twist on what we all do. There's nothing exotic here. Um, it's just, it's a little higher end system and the higher end systems are easier to install because they commission themselves, not well, but you put them in and this one sees, oh, I got a 369 and it, it plugs that in and I got a three ton um, and it, it sets the dip switches for you. Like these are actually easier to install than a single stage system in a whole lot of ways. It is simple. Dead simple. Four freaking wires. I could do it, Tanner. I'm not even an installer. <laughs> Um, uh, and again, what am I doing given the choice of anything? So, and there we go. That is our working through from, um, the suck to blow case against the ERVs. And what we were doing is narrowing down to what we did here, ventilating dehues. They're nice, but they shouldn't always be used. Um, we talked about how blowing is best, but then we left dehumidification off the table. And then tonight we talked about dehumidification and what's nice here, going back to what we talked about earlier, we can do sucking, but this is bad work that makes things worse. We can do sucking and blowing with an ERV, um, and hardly anybody actually installs these. Um, these just don't sell. Or we can do blowing, and at least everybody gets some bit of outdoor air. So don't go home performance bonehead, please. And apply knowledge so it's not useless. And then lots of people can get a really nice system with filtered and dry air. Take that chill pill.
And there we go. Thank you, Nate. That's awesome. That was a big freaking deck. This is 500 slides. <laughs> <laughs> this was stupid. I don't want to do this again for a while. Um, Nate and his slides. The, the visuals do tend to help people. Um, and I mean, it's this right here is the solution to so many problems. And all of us here can sell this with relative ease with a few tweaks. You use the, we have freaking scripts, people. You can follow the script and the software and some newbie is going to go out there and sell this system easily. It's not that hard. Uh, it's simple, just the way it should be. The question is, do you want to actually do things or do you want to do once in the blue moon and stroke your ego online? That's what it is. <laughs> I mean, and are taking shots. <laughs> <laughs> I would say too, a lot of us believe in this system so much that we're putting them in their own houses. Yep. You know. Yeah, Tim, you you've you're, you're trying to figure out are you doing one or two? Yeah, but exactly. You know, exactly. Yeah. Reedy's I've, got one. I've got mm -hmm. one in my garage waiting to put in. Yeah. My shed. Jeff, you're planning to do something like this in yours, right? Yep, after I was promised, uh, didn't get it, but yeah, I'm, I'm getting mine in. You'll get I'm there. Convert to a conversion. Ken? I have dual fuel and a dehumidifier. There you go. Okay. Boo. Five stage, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm going for that. I have that. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, hopefully this ties everything together. So it's important to start with ventilation and understand that that's something that should be on the table and needs to be filtered and dry, but we don't have to do crazy exotic stuff to make that right or right enough to where this plus a $250 DHU every three to five years um, is enough to make a house awesome. Um, and I mean, who here has heard, I mean, we heard from Tim, super comfortable home. Um, the consistent feedback I always got was, I can't believe this is the same house. It was just like, I, I, like, that's what I was expecting. And you can oftentimes do that with just HVAC. That, that's what blew Ted and I's minds because we are shell guys. We're used to insulation and air sealing. That's where we come from. Um, HVAC was new to both of us. Um, but here we are <laughs> on the HVAC side of things because it fixes so much crap. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, anybody else got closing thoughts? Good place to end then. Thank you, you everybody for coming. All right. And what next are we week... going to do? What are we going to do next week? Shit. I don't know. That's your problem. Um, I'm going to be in Vegas. Uh... <laughs> okay. We should brainstorm on Slack. Yep. We will figure all that out. So next week we'll be led by everybody else here. So you won't have to listen to my voice for a change. So um... we're just going to talk smack about everyone that we know. That's mm -hmm. We're just going to make a list of people, start going down the line. We're going to create Nobody's memes. Safe. We're going to we're going to do one of Nate's uh, slideshows with memes. We're getting demonetized, boys. <laughs> I'm starting we'll right now. So good with our language. I'm, okay. I'm amazed. Oh, uh, it's funny. All right. Well, good night, all, and thanks for coming and watching. Appreciate y'all, and uh, see you. Well, everybody else will see everybody next week, and then I'll see you in two weeks. The camera's off. Good night. Huh?